cassava. I lived in Florida for three years now, and I've walked by this strange root time and time again, trying to figure out what to do with it. Oh uh, yeah, find a bag of chips occasionally. The flour is gluten-free, lectin-free. It's actually really good for you. I've also been working on the kitchen vlog, as you know. You've seen some of the videos that Mayan and I have put out there. Now, why am I talking about this today? And why am I here on my balcony instead of in Milan or in New York at a show showing you some great kitchens? Well, mine tells me that there's something special about this, uh, this route. And the funkier it looks, actually, the dirtier it looks, the better it actually may be because, see, there's a, a fungus that lives on here. It's a good fungus. Apparently, it can cure all kinds of things. Now, I'm not going to make any kind of medical claims, especially at a time like this, but I'm stocking up on this. I'm going to actually start cooking it and eating it because from what I've seen, from what I've heard, from what Mayan and his experts have told me, there's something special about this root. And we're going to find out just what that is. I'm going to enable not just myself here isolated on my balcony. I'm not just going to repeat what they say and tell you those stories, but part of what we're doing here is I'm going to try to teach you at home how to do what I'm doing here. I'm a filmmaker. I normally travel all over the world and tell stories about different brands like, well, this is a great brand because they make a product that I just picked up at Whole Foods. I would normally tell a great brand story about something like this, but that's not the point here. The point here is that I want to enable everyone to contribute. At a time like this, where we're sitting at home, watching TV, playing Fortnite all day long, trust me, there's nothing better than saving the world by sitting on your couch and playing Fortnite. I'm actually gonna try to do something that may actually help me and my family and hopefully you. I'm gonna start cooking with this thing and I'm gonna encourage that you guys try it too. It's available everywhere. I just walked into Whole Foods and picked up a bag of this stuff, picked up some flour, picked up some tortillas. I'm gonna cook something with them later on and uh, some of these chips, um, they're pretty good. I normally get the terra chips. There's uh, definitely some yuca root in there. Now, cassava, also known as yuca root, that's what we're gonna be working with. Now, in this first video, I just gave you a little introduction. I'm not gonna get crazy and start cooking right away. I'm not a chef. I am gonna repair a few things. I'm gonna try to help as many people who are talented, more talented than me in cooking and preparing things to actually give you some recipes that are edible. And I'm gonna tell you every step of the way how I'm doing it. Right now, I'm filming with a GH5S and uh, there's a lens on there, a zoom lens. It's a 12 to 35 Sigma 1.8 with a speed booster adapter. All this stuff sounds crazy. I'm gonna give you a list of all equipment that I'm using. I'm gonna to try to enable you not to have to geek out and know everything about cameras or editing gear or anything else, but I'll walk you through step by step what it really takes to tell a great story. First, you need a subject. Our subject here today, cassava. Then you need some gear. This right here, this is my B-roll rig. Now, I've shot some stuff in Whole Foods a few minutes ago when I picked all this stuff up. It's real simple. This is the pocket. Osmo from DJI. It's about 300 bucks for the camera itself. I've added a few more things to this rig than what it normally comes with. This is an optional accessory that you can pick up. It's a little wheel. It allows you to control the up and down tilt and has a few more buttons on here. I've added a little small rig cage on here. This is so I have lots of mount points for throwing this onto a tripod plate, putting it on a tripod, attaching a little light on here. I'm using a little Loom Cube Air. These are great. They have a little magnet on the back so I can stick them somewhere if I'm cooking. I need to pop one of these things on my fridge or anywhere else. These are great little lights to have. The only thing that I don't have set up for this because this is my B-roll camera is there's no audio connected to it. So you shouldn't plan on capturing audio when you're running and gunning and doing B-roll. 
that's always going to slow you down. So in this particular setup, all I need to do is get a couple of shots of what I'm doing at Whole Foods, what I'm buying. You'll see how I use that. I'm also going to use this on my rig as a second camera. You see this little gimbal when I turn it on, right? That camera right there, it's going to stabilize on all three axes and look at what I'm looking at. Now, the great thing about this particular camera, if I turn it sideways, guess what? Now you have a vertical camera. So if I mount this onto a rig with my main camera that's shooting horizontal or 4x3 as I'm doing with my GH5S right now, this can be shooting vertical. And because you have a setting in the window to crop it as a square, you could actually center it as a square and it's still going to record it as 16 by 9 so it gives you the perfect framing for Instagram and records the vertical video for Instagram video. Well, if you shoot horizontally, you got the perfect video for YouTube, Vimeo, or anywhere else. So I think two cameras are helpful if you're trying to have as much reach as possible. And the objective of these videos that we're putting out there, I want everyone to see what I'm doing with this stuff. If stuff helps me, helps my family, it can help you too. So the most important thing to do when you're putting out content is to remove any barriers that you have from people to see it. You want to remove what uh, I think Gary Vee calls friction, and that's important. Friction is what keeps your audience from finding you. And if you're on every platform, if your content is everywhere, you don't have as much friction as you do if you only post it in one place, and more people can consume that content. This is a great little addition to your kit. I'm going to give you all the links to what I'm using so you can build your own kits. And I'm also going to give you a recommended kit, whether you're using a smartphone, a DSLR, or a DSLM, or something like this little DJI thing here. I'm going to hit record on here so I could show you my main rig. This might be overkill for some. And uh, I use this essentially to attach my little small rig cage for the DJI so I can set this up as a vertical on here. I'm using these Rode mics. These are great because they're excellent run and gun mics. I actually don't have a lav. If you take a closer look at where I'm getting my audio from, it's the same kind of box. These are excellent cameras for creating this type of content. And these are excellent microphones to pair with them because the setup is extremely simple. You have a lot of real estate to work with when you're shooting something that's four by three and you can crop in 69 vertical or square. One more thing that I have, if you take a look at this particular setup is I have the actual GH5 interface and that's because I tend to have more than one speaker and you see I have two inputs going in here. So if I'm gonna be interviewing someone, I don't have to just focus on having one mic. I'm using a little Zacuto rig to put everything together and everything's on my nice little really right stuff bowl head i think is rock solid and i'm using this little gitzo waterproof or traveler whatever you call it these are great because i shoot with them everywhere the lens as i mentioned before is a sigma this is a nikon mount 18 to 35 1.8 and it has a metabones adapter very fast lens has lots of control and it allows me to uh, to really set up the shot pretty much anywhere um, that I need. When you're shooting video, what you want is to get a great picture. And a great picture doesn't really come from this, right? A camera is important, but it's not the most important part. The most important part is light. That's the first thing you want to focus on. We haven't talked much about light. That's because, well, the best light is free. I'm sitting out here on my balcony. I'm pretty isolated from the rest of the world. I feel pretty inspired working here. It's a good environment. But more important, the reason I'm out here instead of indoors is because look at the light. I don't have to set up three-point light. I don't even have to set up a single light. All I'm using is this beautiful sunlight. It's as good as it gets. Now, sunlight can be a little tricky. It's hard to work with. Right now, I'm shooting at about 7 p.m. South Florida. It's about golden hour right now. Golden hour, you may have heard it. Everybody looks good, even me. No makeup necessary. Golden hour is when everybody can be attractive. I highly recommend you find yourself a little place where you're shooting at home, wherever you're isolated right now, where you have some decent sunlight. 
If you don't, you're going to need some light. And I'll give you a couple of recommendations of what you can work with. But if you have the opportunity to be outdoors or on a balcony or have a big window, that's a great place to start. Next is going to be glass. Now, a lens is going to be an extremely important component. This tiny little lens on here on this little camera is not great. And the limitation of this is going to be I'm not necessarily going to get the best images indoors. Now, at Whole Foods, they have lots of lights, so everything looks great there. But if I'm going to be at home with minimal light and I'm not going to add any light, you don't want to shoot with this as your main camera. Even at the super fine settings that I'm gonna talk about that give you the best quality out of this camera, you are gonna get a lot of noise, a lot of grain. It's not gonna look great. And you're not gonna be able to push in. I mean, all the things we're talking about, shooting vertical, cropping it, you might wanna get a wide shot out of that too, or at least, you know, like a, a second angle for your YouTube that's not vertical or square, but landscape and you're gonna to have to push in a lot. It's not gonna look great. So this camera, excellent in this environment where I have natural light and lots of it. I don't need a fast lens to do it. Now, the speed of the lens, I just mentioned the fast lens, is measured by its f-stop or t-stop if you're using cinema lenses. That tells us how much light is coming through our lens. And the bigger the opening, or if you have an f-stop number that goes to 1.8, for example, like this lens, the lower the number, because it's actually a ratio that we're talking about. The lower the number, the bigger the opening, the more light comes in, the better the image is going to be, and the more creative control you will have. Right now, I'm not shooting this lens wide open. There's way too much light here. But if I put an ND filter on it, or if I have less light, I can really open up that lens. I'm gonna get a lot of soft elements in the shot known as bokeh. So basically everything that's out of focus will have this beautiful blooming looking uh, feel. Um, your lights will look like orbs of light in the background, gorgeous stuff. Hard to get with your iPhone. Again, that's because of the lens that you have on your phone. The latest iPhone is exceptional and it's great. And for most applications we're talking about, you're not gonna need a camera like a GH5S. Your iPhone will be good enough. But if you wanna get some creative shots and you wanna step up to the next level, a camera like that will be necessary. Again, that'll be my advanced production kit that I'm gonna be talking about. I'm gonna recommend the camera, lenses, and all the accessories that you should get if you wanna tell a story with some more creative control. I'm also gonna give you an iPhone production kit and I'm gonna mention everything about this little kit, whether it's a B-roll camera or your main camera. And we're gonna jump into post-production. Once we shoot, get some great images. I wanna talk about workflow, basic workflow, of getting stuff from camera to your computer into a piece of software where you can actually put everything together and then deliver and distribute on every single platform. Uh, my goal will be to get this content out onto YouTube, to get it onto Vimeo, to put it on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram video, LinkedIn. If I left something out, I'm sure it'll be on there too. But the way to do that is to use the tools that allow you to get there quickly. Now we're ready for the post-production part. I have copied the files from the memory card onto my desktop. And we're gonna use a piece of software called DaVinci Resolve. Now, let's, let's jump into my screen. You'll be able to either purchase their full version, which again, this is what I use, what I'm using here. I do not recommend that you go out and spend $300 right away. The free version is more than capable. And like I said before, I've cut multiple TV shows on the free version. There's very little that's missing from being able to deliver a full feature project. If you go to downloads, support, for example, DaVinci Resolve, you'll find all the latest updates. The studio update is the paid one, the Resolve, 16.2 is the latest one, and you can install this on a Mac, Windows, or Linux. All right, enough about that. When you launch DaVinci Resolve for the first time, just clicked on my icon down here, and this little pop-up came up. Now, in this particular screen, we have 
a variety of databases that are listed there. If they're hitting, that's because this button right here, this little side panel is gone. Just click on that. And we're gonna create a new database. Click new. I'm gonna choose the create option and we'll use the disk option. This allows us to move this database with ease and you don't have to worry about uh, managing a hidden file structure somewhere. Although Postgres can be a little faster on some projects, we'll keep it simple. I'm gonna go ahead and give this database a name. We're gonna call this Cassava and give it a directory that I want to put it on. I'm gonna put it onto my external drive, Necromancer here. According to Jan, Cassava, that's where I have all my footage. Let's go ahead and open that up and choose that and create. Now, it has files in there. And even though I wanted to put it in the same directory, if you already have a file structure existing in that folder, you shouldn't use that as a database folder. So I'm gonna once go out there, go back to that same exact folder, Necromancer, according to Jan, Cassava, instead of just dropping in here, we'll create a new folder and we'll call this our resolve database dash cassava. and hit open. So once you create this database, you'll have a new entry here for databases and an untitled project to begin with. If you double click on this thing, you'll see you get a little dialog box that pops up right away. And that has to do with where things are getting cached to, where temporary files are being created. Don't worry about this, I'll show you how to fix that. As soon as you hit okay, you'll get another one that tells you, wait a minute, your um, gallery stills are gonna go to a directory I don't have access to. Again, these are three directories that we're gonna set for our projects and we'll work with moving forward. I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And it's gonna jump into DaVinci Resolve. Again, we have some problems we need to solve before we start doing work. So I'm gonna click on this little sprocket down here in the very far bottom right corner called Project Settings. If you pop that up, you will have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Don't worry about this. You don't need to understand everything here. Um, you could leave it pretty much the way it is. If you understand the settings of what you're delivering and will be delivering to the web, so you can leave them alone at 1920 by 1080, 24. These are the settings we're gonna be changing when we're gonna be making a square version, which is 1080 by 1080, or if we want to make a vertical version, which is gonna be 1080 by 1920. Right now, we're gonna leave it on default by 1920 by 1080. This is our full HD resolution and what we wanna to deliver to YouTube. Again, we're gonna to have to create multiple projects depending on where we want to deliver this way. Down here, you'll find the working folders, the cache files and the gallery stills. I'm gonna click on browse. And again, I'm gonna put things in a nice place. According to Jan, Cassava, we're gonna go ahead and create a new folder here. I'm gonna call this one Resolve Cache. And we're gonna make sure all the working folders are set to that directory. Let's click Browse, choose Resolve Cache. You could set gallery stills to a different location, but I don't see an issue with using the same directory for both. And also there's one more directory under Capture and Playback. If you click there and navigate down to Capture, you'll see Save Clips To. You could use, again, a Capture Scratch directory if you are capturing from tape or somewhere and you want to uh, store that in a separate drive, separate directory. I'm not capturing anything. I'm just gonna go ahead and specify that same directory just so I don't get that dialog box every time I open my project. Before we jump too deep into editing this project, I wanna talk a little bit about workflow. Good practice early on will save you a ton of headache later on. First thing I wanna do is add a source folder here. As you can see, I've already created one and I have actually copied and named most of the files here a few are still unnamed, and these particular files right here, these are my iPhone files, which I just went out and shot real quick because uh, when I was shooting this originally, I had my B-roll camera, but I was attaching my B-roll camera to the rig. So I needed to shoot a few more files with my iPhone. These haven't been renamed yet, so I'll show you how I do this. I'm gonna right-click this and right-click, rename all four items. This allows you to batch these together. And since I started naming my previous iPhone items, I'm gonna just continue to modify this name here and choose where I want it to start, which these go all the way up to eight. So of course I will add nine here. Now let's go ahead and rename these. And you can see all of my iPhone clips have been properly renamed. All of my GH5 clips 
are properly named, and all of my B-roll from the Pocket Osmo are properly named. Now let's talk a little bit about this naming convention that I'm using here. Of course, you have tons of information in metadata, but I don't want to jump that far yet. Let's keep it really simple. I want to make sure that any of the search criteria that we might need in this particular project is existing in the file name itself. For example, you see that at the very beginning, I have A2Y, that's my according to Jan project that I'm calling this, and the Cassava episode one, well, that's the episode we're filming right now. And you could see the camera name, in case I want to select everything from a particular camera and treat it a certain way, like color correct it or stabilize it or what have you. And uh, then the number of that particular clip. Now, this numbering, I just go one through nine, whatever it is, because I don't keep my original camera files. I uh, just basically copy these over and keep these names. I never want to refer to what was on my memory card. Um, if you are going to keep your camera originals, your memory cards, you might want to include whatever the original naming number was there into here so you can match them later on. It'd be a little easier that way. Since I'm not doing that, I'm just going to number one through whatever and keep it simple. Now that's all named. Let's jump back into DaVinci Resolve and in our project, let's talk a little bit about this UI that we're working with. Down here, you will find a bar with a whole bunch of icons on it. And this interface is actually really simple. It looks really crazy. I mean, you take a look at all of these UI elements and I'll click through some of these so you can get a better understanding of what we're looking at. This is the media tab in which we have the ability to manage all of the media that's coming from our source drives. These are the drives that are connected to my computer right here. And if I click on one of these, for example, I'll go into Necromancer and we'll go into our project here, which is according to Jan, Cassava, and you'll see that source file right here. You could also toggle these down and open these up or click on here to see what's inside. And you can click and preview any one of the clips in here. You could play them back, hear the audio. You could even see all of the metadata to find out more about this clip, like if it has audio, how many channels of audio it has, what Kodak it's in, what the resolution is, frame rate, all that wonderful stuff. And of course, if you click down here, you could see a whole bunch of different metadata groups that will give you different information that can come from your camera or elsewhere. Now, we're not gonna jump into any of this stuff right here. This is a little too advanced for what we need to do here. What I wanna talk about in this interface is basically how to get stuff into DaVinci Resolve so we can start editing. Up here, that's your computer. Down here, that's DaVinci Resolve. This allows you to preview either what's on your computer or what's in DaVinci Resolve. And in this particular panel, we can organize things into things called bins. Now there's a whole bunch of different kinds of bins. We'll keep with the very basic one that we create by just right clicking on here and choosing add bin. Now there's another way to do that. I just wanna create a bin or a folder named source and bring all of my stuff in. So just grab that folder, drag it right in here and you can see it's gonna ask you this question. Now this question right here is very important to answer properly because if you just quickly change the default, which is outlined in orange and hit change, what's gonna happen is this information that we looked at in our clip right here, well, there's three different types of clips in here. So I guess the first one that it's gonna look at is what's gonna determine what it's gonna change our project into. And we're not delivering a 4K project, right? We have set our settings either to be 1920 by 1080 for YouTube, Again, you could do a full 4K and upload that to YouTube if you choose to. Not necessary though. And it will take away a lot of the things we could do in post, like push in and stabilize. Therefore, we're gonna stick to 1920 by 1080. It's good to just set up things the way they should be set up and you're good to go. So I'm gonna hit don't change to keep my project settings. And you can see everything that's on my computer now is also available for me to use in DaVinci Resolve. Now, the next few tabs, this is where you do the bulk of the heavy lifting and all the work. You have two different tabs for edit. And if you click on the first one, you'll see this one is a very simple UI where you get a little thumbnail view of every little icon and you can kind of skim right through it. This makes editing real easy. For those of you that tried Final Cut Pro 10, this is very familiar, very simple, very straightforward. You could list um, all of your clips in here as well if you prefer to look at it that way. And of course, you have a monitor here that allows you to double click on these things and you could see the clip played back. You could drag the clip right into your timeline and it's gonna drop it at the beginning of your timeline. But as you drop things in here, you get two different timelines. As you can see, the first one, 
allows you to drag through everything. And the clip down here gives you a close-up view. So you don't have to constantly zoom in and out. You could see a full overview of everything in the top. Let me add a few more clips here. I'm just gonna add another clip here. And you could see everything is available for us to skim through in the top. And if we're working really close in here and we want to maybe zoom in a little bit more or something, we could see exactly where that edit point is. If you're more familiar with something like Adobe Premiere, or if you prefer to work in something that is a little bit less abstracted, I, I love this UI. Personally, I think this is gonna be the future of editing, but I do wanna show you one more thing. If you click on the Edit tab, now this is a more traditional one, you don't get two timelines, right? You have your traditional source, and you do have your timeline window here as well. And as you skim through here, notice you don't have two timelines, you just have one. So you could zoom in and out of your timeline, and you have a little bit more control over how you work with your tracks. Edit is really quick. If you don't wanna worry about how you're layering your tracks together and doing all that, this is probably gonna be a much easier place to work. You can achieve almost all of the same results. In fact, instead of jumping to an inspector, you can click on this little icon right here and you have all of your major controls, whether you're trying to stabilize a shot or push in or do anything cool with it. You could see cropping, your music, all this different stuff is available in this little UI. I think this is a great UI to experiment with. I personally, prefer to work with edit because I like a little bit more control over how I trim my clips and what I do with them. But I have a sneaking suspicion that as this interface evolves, I'm gonna probably ignore edit in future ones and start working with this uh, cut interface instead. Again, like I mentioned before, if you do prefer to work in something more traditional like Adobe Premiere, I'm gonna just stick to this. I'm gonna delete those clips and let's talk about how we actually cut these things together. Well, let's start with our narrative, which came from the GH5. I'm gonna drop that in here and hit play. And you can see I have my clip here. Now, what am I looking at in this particular clip? I'm gonna hit Shift Z just so I could see everything. And I'll pull down my audio tab just a tad bit so I could see a little bit more of my waveform. As we push into different parts of this, you could see that some parts are flatter than others. And if I get close to where I see these peaks start to happen, you know, this is around the time where we're gonna get some loudness or some sound. We can actually hear stuff. So as I play back the silent stuff, you could see that's just dead space. If I jump to where I have sound, you could see I'm talking. So you can quickly find uh, your cut points by just looking at the waveform. You don't necessarily have to visually watch every single frame. You could quickly learn how to navigate. Like I can see right here, there's some dead space here. I'm probably getting ready for a retake or something. You can quickly find your takes. So when you're recording, it's important that you don't just ramble on. It's not important to get everything in one take, but what is important is that you get complete thoughts and if you stuck, don't just go crazy and cut and then, or try to pick up immediately where you left off. You might not give yourself a good cut point. Always give yourself a little breathing space. Just stop, refocus, give it some dead space so you have something to find very quickly using the waveform and then start the complete thought from the beginning. Okay, you don't have to start from the very top, just a good place to cut. And you'll see how this comes together because I do that quite a lot. As we start working here, I could see that maybe, well, this is not the shot. I come in, it's here, and I just kind of push those things away, right? I'm gonna use the J, K, N, L keys right here on my keyboard. Now, if you look at the keyboard that we're working with here, you have these three keys right here, J, K, and L. If I hit the L key, you'll see, actually, I hit the J key first. If you hit the J key, you see it plays backwards. K will stop, L will play forward. Tapping on each of these keys twice, either the J or the L, will move forward or backwards faster or slower if you hold the K key and press L or J. You could play back in slow motion or even tap to go one frame at a time. So the J, K, and L keys are a great way for you to use both hands when you're editing, one on a mouse, one on the keyboard. I think that's the most efficient way to work. So get to use 
a few keyboard shortcuts that will make your life easier. Again, if you forget about JKL, don't worry about it. Just hit the space bar. That'll play for you. Space again, we'll stop. If I click on this point right here, let me zoom in a little bit tighter so I can move at finer increments. And let's press play. All right, so just before I move my arms, that's where I want this clip to begin. You know, we have a lot of dead space in here, and of course, there's lots of ways we could trim this clip and edit this clip. There's a million tools up here, and I will definitely go through most of these tools in future tutorials. But to start, I wanna keep this very simple, so we'll just stick to the default tool that we have selected, which is this arrow tool, and we're gonna use a keyboard shortcut to make a cut. Now, if you forget the arrow tool, A for arrow, and you go back to that default tool. Always choose the arrow tool in case you click on something else so you don't do something you'll regret. The arrow tool should be your default. So with the arrow tool selected, what we could do is just trim this clip right to where that playhead is or right to where I wanna be and just move this clip back to the beginning so it starts at the beginning. Now, you don't have to start right from the very first frame. You could actually start from a black frame or give yourself a second or so a black and then you can have it come in. You could even do a fade up. So those are your options. You could do quite a few things when you start. I'm gonna go to the very top and just make sure it starts at the very beginning. We don't need any black there. Now the other thing I wanna do is I wanna look at this shot. We shot this in an aspect ratio that is different than what we're delivering. Now this wasn't a mistake, this was done intentionally. I mentioned that I shoot in four by three before and primarily that's because the Panasonic GH5 has the capability of recording four by three anamorphic and we're using that. We're not using an anamorphic lens, but we are recording it in four by three. This gives us a little bit more real estate to be able to crop in at 16 by nine, either vertically or horizontally. And it's a lot closer to a square. So I'm gonna lose just a little bit on the sides here. So when I'm composing with four three, it's a lot easier for me to deliver to Instagram, Instagram video or YouTube. I could choose that in post. And I'll show you how to do that with three different projects that we're gonna create here. Now, the next thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about the color. Notice how washed out this looks. Now, that is by design. This is log encoded video. You don't need to understand exactly what log is just yet. Just know if your camera has that capability, you're not doing all of the processing in camera. You're gonna be doing your processing in post in DaVinci Resolve or another tool. That makes your images look kind of flat and ugly coming straight out of camera, but it also preserves the highlights and the shadows and allows us to have much more dynamic range and an image that we can shape and make look the way we want to, not the way the camera chooses to. That being said, I'm gonna do one quick color correction to make my life easier. So if you just select the clip, we don't actually have to go into color to do this. I'm gonna do what's called an auto color balance. It's gonna go ahead and automatically adjust the black and white point and try to adjust the color balance as well so it's neutral. The way we can do this without going into the color interface at all is simply select the clip and hit C. Now you'll see it automatically adjusts and gives us a really cool color correction. Now this is a good start. Um, probably what the camera would have done if we were not recording in log. So pretty decent. If you look at this icon up here for color, notice how it's now in color. I'm gonna click on that and we could turn off our correction and I can click on it again and we could turn it on. So you could see what that quick auto color did. Now you don't have to know anything about color to get that 90% of the time if you shot your clips properly, it's gonna look great and you don't have to do anything else. The other thing I wanna do with this particular clip and every clip that I'm gonna bring in is I want to go to Retime and Scaling. I'm gonna double click on that and choose Scaling and choose Fill. This is something you can choose inside of your project settings down in this little sprocket here and make sure that when you bring your footage in, it automatically conforms and fills instead of trying to use the project settings which right now are telling it to just fit. So it's gonna to try to keep all the pixels without doing anything there. So I'm gonna choose fill 
and it's going to fill all of our pixels in. And actually this is a pretty decent composition. I don't have to do much more, but I am gonna kind of scroll through this to make sure that I have enough headroom. There is nothing that is uh, as annoying as just seeing the top of your head almost touching the top there. Just let it breathe a little bit. The rule of thumb is like, put two and a half, three fingers above your head. And uh, just that's kind of the, what you want, depending on the size of your fingers. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this position controller right here and Y and just bring this down so it looks like I have enough space above my head so it doesn't look like I'm right at the edge there. Because I am moving, it's not like that all the time. Sometimes I dip, but when I do come up, it, it looks a lot better that way. So that's pretty much what we're gonna do with the image right now. Of course, we can do a lot more and I can make this image look amazing, but we'll leave it at here and talk a little bit more about editing. Now, if you have a nice strong machine that's capable of keeping up with all of the corrections you've added, you'll see that, well, it'll play back real time. You'll have that right here. It says 24 frames per second when I hit play. If you don't, you can simply turn off your color correct and you'll see that it allows you to play back quicker because you don't have all of your corrections applied. Now, this is working great because all I did was an auto balance. But if you step into color and you do some of the things in there, like maybe I wanna go ahead and get rid of some of the wrinkles in my face or the dark circles under my eyes, kinda of just clean up my face a little bit, do some of that. That stuff could be very taxing. If I have a noisy image and I wanna do some noise reduction, that stuff could really be taxing. So you don't wanna do all that work, then come back and start editing and find out that it won't play back. So turning it off, that could be a quick solution. And when you're ready to render, just turn it right back on and output. So we'll keep this on for now because it looks so much better and you know our machine can handle it. Just for the expedience of things, obviously I'm gonna spend a lot of detail in finding my cut points, in trimming my cut points and doing all that. But to quickly show you how these tools work, I'm gonna just cut out random pieces and show you how to make modifications and tweaks. We'll get into the specifics of which tool and how you want to use it when you start doing fine trimming in more advanced projects later on. For now, I'm gonna stick to that arrow tool and I'm gonna use one keyboard shortcut that's gonna be Command B for blade. All right, see that razor blade here? Just hitting B will switch to the razor blade. So if you're only gonna be using a mouse, which is perfectly okay, you can just use a mouse, right? And you can do all the editing with a mouse by clicking on these buttons and doing everything in here. Or if you're gonna use a keyboard and a mouse, a keyboard shortcut and using the mouse is gonna make it the most efficient way to maneuver through DaVinci Resolve. The keyboard shortcut for adding a cut is Command B. If I switch to the blade tool, right, by hitting B, I can just find a place where I wanna cut and it'll do essentially the same exact thing. Now, as I move my playhead, and let me just click on my arrow tool again and deselect, you'll see that these cuts look exactly the same. When you perform a blade cut, whether you do it on one track or multiple track, you'll get these double dotted lines. And what these double dotted lines means is that, well, even though you put a cut here, this footage is gonna continue on, right? You haven't deleted anything yet. We haven't trimmed anything yet. So this type of an edit is called a through edit. And a through edit can simply be removed if you accidentally put it in there by clicking on it, selecting it, and hitting the delete key. And now that edit is gone, and your clip is now one piece again, if you go ahead and remove all of these. I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo twice because I want those edit points in there. I wanna show you what we can do once we've added a few cuts in here. If you select the clip by just dragging a selection or just clicking on it, right, it allows you to just select that clip and you can do one of two things with this clip with the keyboard shortcut right now. Actually, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can go ahead and use your standard cut tools like Command X to cut it out. That will also keep it in memory in case you wanted to just select it, go ahead and cut it out there, and maybe go ahead and paste it somewhere else, Command V. That's one way in which you can utilize the same tools that you have elsewhere in uh, basically 
Excel or Word where you cut and paste all day long, but you have a few unique tools in an editing application. One is called a lift edit and the other is called a ripple delete. And the way uh, to think about that is, well, you can just make a gap in here, press the delete key, and we call that a lift. Essentially, you're taking the clip and you're lifting it out of your timeline. That creates a gap which you need to now fill. Why would you want to do that? Well, let's say you have a specific duration that you want to meet, and this clip is that duration. And now you need to find something that you need to fill this with. So lifting that clip up will not cascade this timeline down, making it shorter and potentially putting things out of sync that depended on that clip being there, like graphics or uh, B-roll or other things that you haven't connected yet to your timeline that may be sitting there. So sometimes the ripple effect of having it just come down the timeline is not what you desire. In that regard, you want to do what's called a ripple delete. And that looks like this. If you hold the shift key down and hit that same backspace or delete key, boom, it's going to go ahead and lift that clip and delete that gap. Now you can do that manually with just a delete key without holding the shift by selecting the clip, deleting it, selecting the gap and deleting that. But that's two things, that's inefficient. If you have a full-size keyboard, you don't have to use the shift modifier with delete to do the ripple delete. You can actually just use the regular forward delete key, that one right there, not the full-on delete key. And that little delete key will perform that same function. That is pretty much what we're gonna do throughout this entire narrative to go ahead and cut it up and remove the pieces we don't want to string together the narrative part, the talking head part, you know, the part of just me just engaging with the camera and we're not gonna add any B-roll at this particular point. Now, B-roll is a cutaway, right? A cutaway is uh, when you cut to something other than the talking head but you cut to something in context. For example, if I'm talking about this little camera and how great a view I have, it would be great for me to show the view of what that camera is recording at that particular moment, right? I don't want to do something out of context, like show you a photograph of a gazelle or something. It doesn't make any sense, right? So B-roll is not just random footage that you stick in there to cover a gap, although many people do that and they just find some beautiful pictures to put in there. And it may work for some things because editing is not about being linear. It's about actually uh, you using the same kind of techniques that your brain does when you sleep and dream. Never mind. We'll get back to that later. We're going to go ahead and make these cuts and get rid of our gaps as we cut through this to shape our narrative. Once we're ready for B-roll, we're going to put it right on top just to see how it works. So if I have a clip in here from my iPhone, for example, and again, I'm just randomly taking clips here. There we go. Some yucca root. Let's say we want a close up of this yucca root. I'm going to set an in in here. And the way you set an in point is you have this little in point icon. And if you want to set an out point, you could move your playhead in here or use these controls to play through the clip and set out. Uh, the keyboard shortcuts for that are real simple. In is I and out is O. Oh, real simple. In and out. Now, conveniently, if you learned your J, K, and L keys, guess where the I and O are? That's right, right above them. It makes it much simpler for you to edit if you just learn those five keys. You have all of your transport controls. You have the ability to set your in and out. You have the delete key not too far within the reach of the same hand. So essentially, your left hand can achieve all this relatively quickly without you having to figure out which button to press. And the rest, navigation, can be done with a mouse. As I go through this, I might find that I want to delete a piece here, Command B, Command B, select that and hit delete. I also tend to do one thing with B-roll. I want to add that cassava. Notice that when I drop it here, it brings the audio in as well. Now for B-roll, I don't need audio, I just need the video. So. If you look into your source monitor here, you have this little icon here, right? That's video and that's audio. So if all I need is to bring in the video of this thing, I can just grab that and put that on top and let's go ahead and push in here a little bit. And you can see now it's gonna cut away to that shot of the cassava. Very cool. Um, additionally, if you don't wanna hear what's going on here, you can mute this, right? I 
tend to work a lot inside of color. So I use the mute inside of the color interface. I'm gonna go back here. If I hit play now, you won't hear any sound. Just remember that. If you're in a different panel somewhere like color and you hit mute and you come back here and you don't hear anything, there's nothing wrong with your system. Just make sure you've unmuted your audio. Okay, when you're working in color, that button exists there specifically because, well, you don't need to hear the audio when you're doing color. It actually gets in the way and it has a different caching engine. So it's not gonna play back the same way. It's gonna give priority more to picture, not to audio in the color viewer. And when you're playing back in here, it's gonna give priority to audio and not to picture. So, and that's because when you're editing, audio is more important than picture. You, if you can't hear your audio, there's no way you'll be able to make a proper cut. So with my audio turned off, I now have one video track, which is my narrative a second video track, which is my B-roll. I now have two clips to potentially correct, right? One on top and one on the bottom. And that might make it really complicated for me when I get to color. So when I'm done editing, I like to collapse my tracks. A lot of editors like to leave them that way, but me personally, I like to commit my edits and bring it right back down into track number one, making it a little easier for me to perform different trims. Right? Let's say I want to change where this cut is. Again, with just the arrow tool selected, if you click on the edit point, you can actually move that edit point to a new location. Like let's say I wanted to happen right here. Now you'll notice that both of the edit points are green now. If I wanna pull this in this direction, it doesn't go anywhere. And I had this little red um, edit point in the beginning. Well, that's because that's the beginning of my media. I don't have something called a handle. A handle means that, well, let's take a look. If I double click on my media clip, right at the beginning, I haven't recorded anything there. And right at the end, I haven't recorded anything after that. That's called a media limit. So if I want to have the ability to trim this clip, to add a transition or do something, what I should do is have a little bit of space before I use that clip. So I have some frames uh, before that edit point to manipulate and that's called a handle. So if I started this clip, let's say over here and you could see my edit point is no longer the media limit. I have some more media here. So let me get rid of this particular clip. I'm going to drop this in here now and you could see if I click in here and drag it into the left. Now I can go, I can go as far as the media permits me in either direction. So that's something to keep in mind also when you shoot. Make sure you give yourself a little bit more space before you start talking. Because if you hit record and you get into your point right away, you're not gonna have any breathing room. And if you need to do a little trimming, you might find it kind of difficult. Always give yourself some room for a handle. My rule of thumb is about three seconds. So hit record, wait three seconds, then let something important happen. If you didn't get that, give it another try. It's uh, it's important that you give a little bit of a handle to all your shots, especially B-roll. Okay, assuming we have a timeline that we're happy with, I'm just gonna back out of my project. See this little house icon down here? If you click on that, that's gonna show you all your projects. And well, this particular project right here is the one we're working with, but if I click on my A2Y cassava. This is actually a project that I've been working on in the background and because I renamed a whole bunch of stuff in here, some stuff is offline, don't worry about that. I wanna kinda just get in here and show you how I've trimmed a bunch of these clips and uh, I have a more complete timeline now. Some of these are just jumping and you could see that when I have a jump cut, and a jump cut is defined by the camera angle not changing and you know, obviously that time has been displaced so much and you make a jump. Well, the camera angle should change a little bit, about, I'd say, 30 degrees or so. So if you're using multiple cameras, set them about 30 degrees apart. If you have them any tighter, make sure you have significant difference in focal length. Otherwise, it'll really feel like um, awkward. To avoid that awkwardness, what I've done here, as you can see, is I've kind of uh, simulated a push in. So if I play this, you'll see that it starts out with uh, my shot being framed exactly like we had framed in the other cut. And when I cut to a different take or a different piece of footage, what you'll see is now it pushes in. That is how I can get away with working with one camera instead of multiples. Let me show you how that works. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go back to my other project. And you can go between projects very quickly. Another thing you can do is actually copy and paste between projects. The way you do that is you enable right up here under DaVinci Resolve, 
in preferences is you do want to go into user and you want to enable under project save and load, you want to make sure that you have live save enabled. And uh, once you have live saved enabled, you can actually jump back and forth between projects. That's pretty great little feature. Additionally, you have the ability to do a project backup. When you do project life saves, you are continuously overriding the project incrementally. And if you wanted to have an archive of that particular project, you don't have one anymore. So if you're not manually doing a save as, you're continuously updating that project and going back to a different version will be next to impossible. That's why we have this thing called project backups. Based on your settings here, you'll be able to implement a method by which a project is incrementally saved for you. And if your live save becomes corrupt, or if you wanna go back to a previous version, you could always restore from one of these backups. Let's go ahead and hit save here or cancel. And I'm gonna go back to my previous project that's a little simpler to look at, the cassava one here. And I'm gonna show you how to make that jump cut. Basically, find a place where you need to make that cut. Again, I'm just gonna pick a random cut right here, hit Command B so I have a separate clip. And this particular clip, as you can see, it's continuous, right? I'll play that back. It continues on here, but you can select this clip because it's cut out and you can change the sizing. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You could use these controls inside your inspector. If it's turned off, just click that icon right there. And if you want to visually do it, now, first of all, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit, just so I have a little bit more of a canvas to work on, and click on this icon right here. This will give me the controls for moving this image around. So I can actually just click on one of these corners and scale it, and I could move it around to get the framing exactly the way I want. And when I hit play now, let's get a little closer. you see it jumps in there. And even though it is a jump cut, it is a more emphasized jump cut by pushing in on it. If you had an area like this, for example, let me go ahead and do another cut here and make a jump cut that is a little bit uh, more of what we're gonna experience if we're just cutting things out. So if I just cut that stuff out here, you can see it, Ah, oh yeah, it's a real apparent jump cut. You can definitely see that. So in this case, you have very few options, right? Um, even the little blending morph cut that's in here, that really won't do much when you have that much of a change. So your options are A, B-roll, so you can cut away to some B-roll and uh, you can look at that and then come back to the shot so you don't see a jump, or you can do something with this particular shot. If you don't have a second angle, if you've only shot with one camera and you've shot it in 4K because you have more resolution, grabbing this particular shot, we can click on this little icon here, push in here and you know, give ourselves a different vantage point. And now we've overemphasized that jump cut so much that it almost looks like an alternative angle. Not quite, because if we were a good director of photography, we would position that camera off uh, angle a little bit, about, you know, a couple of degrees off. I, I usually like to keep them about 30 degrees apart so they don't jump too much. But in this regard, if we're shooting with one camera, you can see, bam. It works. It looks like a completely different camera angle and we can definitely make that work. So in productions where you are using one single camera for narrative and you might not have enough B-roll or relative B-roll to cover up that transition point and a transition doesn't work, overemphasizing that jump cut will make it blend. Assuming we have done everything we need to get this out. Let's actually talk about delivery. The final tab in here is called delivery. And when you get to delivery, you have a timeline here too, and you could hit Shift Z to zoom out and see your entire timeline. Um, you have up top here, this little gray bar. This little gray bar is showing us the range of what will or will not be exported. For example, let's say I wanted this one clip in the beginning. I wanted to export just that to maybe test it or just to see what it's gonna look like or maybe I just needed this shot in something else that I wanted to use. So you can mark the length of anything you want to export by hitting in and out here. If you wanna mark the entire clip, hit the X key and that'll mark the in and out of that entire clip. If you want everything, just hit option X and it'll clear 
the selection and mark the entire timeline for you. Notice you can also choose your in and out range or entire timeline if you do have a selection. Just check this to make sure you're outputting your entire timeline if that's what you want to do. You have a bunch of presets of how you want to output this clip. Let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. Now, obviously this clip is gonna wind up ultimately on different social media platforms, but not all social media platforms are created equal. For example, if I wanna upload stuff to YouTube, I can upload a ProRes file, basically an uncompressed master file, and YouTube will compress it for me. I could do the same thing with Vimeo. Now, depending on your um, plan with Vimeo and depending on uh, certain things with uh, YouTube as well, you might have a certain size limitation on how big these files are that you're uploading. So you have to kind of um, be wary that ProRes, especially at long durations, will be huge, much bigger than a compressed file. But if you have the capability of having a master file as ProRes and outputting is ProRes. Now I'm talking ProRes here, but some of you are on Windows, so that may not be an option for you. For those of you on Windows uh, and you don't have ProRes as an option, there are other codecs. And um, when we start talking about compression, we'll get into that. Right now I'm on a Mac, so I'm gonna assume that you have a Mac. If not, then just stick to an H.264 master for now. Notice how you have a ProRes master and an H.264 master. Now H.264 is heavily compressed. There are other options on Windows that are better, but I don't want to get into third parties and trying to understand codecs just yet. I want to kind of work with what's built in here. And we'll start with ProRes because that's going to get us the best possible file that we can go ahead and recompress later on to upload to different networks. Starting here, I want to mark just a small in and out. And that's going to give me the ability just to run through this very quickly so we don't have to look at a long progress bar of output. And let's talk about some of these settings. I'm gonna click this little arrow down here and that's gonna expand this view so I'm not seeing anything else. You can see, you can change the UI by clicking on a few of these things. Same thing with your job queue down here, you can do that as well. I tend to wanna have a big timeline when I'm working and when I'm working with uh, output or anything like that, I wanna make sure that if I open all of these different settings up that I don't have to scroll endlessly to find things. We're not gonna look at advanced or subtitles or anything in this particular clip. We're just gonna use the preset to begin with. When we click on ProRes Master, if you're on Windows, just use the H.264 Master for now. And we're gonna specify where we want to put this file. So I'm gonna click Browse, and I'm gonna go to my Cassava folder, create a new folder here called Output. And I'm gonna call this one Cassava one and hit save. This file did not magically appear in that folder when you hit save. All you've done is committed where that file will go to once you create it. That's it. You just basically told this little setting right here of where you want to write this file. It hasn't actually saved anything yet. Now you can go ahead and play with the different settings. Now, if you've chosen the ProRes Master, don't worry about any of these other settings just yet, okay? We'll get into all of these settings in the future. For now, I want to make sure you know how to get stuff out of here. I want you to hit the Add Render Queue button. And what that will do is it'll kick you off from this left side of the interface to the right side of the interface, which is where you have queued up all of the different render jobs that you have defined the settings for you've added them into this render queue. So now you can process these jobs and actually create the frames and the video clips of what you're working with. The render queue simply lists all of the jobs and the status of those jobs, whether they rendered, whether they failed. Right up here, you'll see a whole bunch of icons. As we perform different tasks, these icons will change in color and have different indications on whether you know, a job went through, if it was rendered, if it failed, what needs to happen here. If the job is selected, notice you have a white outline, it will be rendered or that file will be written to disk when you start render. If nothing is selected, if you click on this gray area back here, and if you have multiple jobs, you don't have to individually select them. Nothing selected means it'll render everything in the queue. If there is something you do not want to render anymore, you want to get rid of that job, just click the little X key, it'll get rid of it. And if you just wanna quickly purge all of your render jobs, you can click this little triple dot here and it'll show you um, if you 
want to clear just your render jobs or all of them, you can just clear them from here and don't have to click the X individually. You could show job details and it'll give you specifics on what codec you're writing, frame rate, all that stuff. And if you want to make changes to that, just click on this little pencil icon, make the modifications and hit update job or you can add it to a new job if you want to make another version of it here. Maybe I want to make an H.264 version, but keep everything else the same. I can add it as a new job and you could see now it's going to create a ProRes master and an H.264 master for me. And I didn't have to go through all that jazz of telling it where it's going to go. You could see that it's going to have two files. Well, they're going to override each other. The one thing I should have done is change the name from Cassava 1 to Cassava 2 on here. Again, you can click on the pencil, go back in here, change that and hit update job. And now you can see it's going to write Cassava 1 and Cassava 2. I don't need Cassava 2. We'll get rid of that. We'll just select this job, start render, and you can see it'll process that file fairly quickly. And you can see the progress in here, the percentage and the time remaining. And you can actually inspect what you're doing by looking at the frames to make sure everything looks good. This is a great time not to walk away and let it do its thing, but to actually watch it as it moves through. And you can kind of spot check by the frames that are being displayed as it's rendering through, whether you know all your color corrections match, whether things look good. I find tons of mistakes at this particular stage and I don't have to actually watch the entire project. The first few times I render it, I can catch a bunch of stuff and then I watch the rendered file. It'll be uh, performing much quicker, especially if your machine is not up to par and you can't play back with all of your effects enabled. Creating that file, then playing it back in QuickTime or any other player will allow you to view it the same way the viewer will and you'll have a much better experience doing the quality control. That's it for this first introduction into what we're gonna be doing. Hopefully, by the end of this work at home period, you guys have plenty of time and I have plenty of time to create the videos for you to watch and we'll be able to learn a lot of great techniques and I'll be able to see some of the stories you tell. In addition to these YouTube videos that I'm creating to teach you how to put these stories together, I am gonna hold a weekly or a bi-weekly webinar. It's gonna be completely free. You guys can join the webinar and ask questions and we will talk about some of the things you'll find in these YouTube videos and jump a lot deeper into some of the subjects that haven't been clear. So if you miss something, send me a DM, post on the YouTube channel. I'll make sure to follow up in a new video and I'll make sure to talk about it on the next webinar, especially if you join. So if you wanna know more about the free webinars and you want to participate in future YouTube videos, please follow us, hit subscribe, give us a like and communicate with us. We'll make sure to incorporate everything you tell us into everything we do.